My name is Marcin Jones. Uh, I'm an environmental studies major and I'm a senior and I'm going to be going over Arctostaphylos uva ursi, which is also known as bearberry. Uh, the plant is an evergreen shrub and it grows in temperate zones in the northern hemisphere, ranges all the way across the northern U.S. and into Canada. It uh, can also be found in Europe and in parts of Russia as well, obviously in those temperate zones. Um, within those areas it can also, at elevations between 3,000 and 9,000 feet, you can find it. So uh, it grows down through the Rocky Mountains and down through the Appalachian Mountains. The Rocky Mountains down into New Mexico and the Appalachian Mountains down into Georgia. So you can find it all over the United States and into Canada and places like that. Its leaves are dark green um, and leathery. They've got twisted trunks and the flowers that form on this plant are little white and pink urn shaped clusters. Um, the berries you can see here in this picture are little red circular berries and they're very dry and mealy. They are edible so you can't eat the berries. Um, and it's usually found on open rocky slopes. Um, so this plant is one that, after moderate disturbances, crops up pretty quickly. Some of the traditional uses, it was first recorded in the 13th century in a pharmacopoeia of the Welsh called the Physicians of Midfi. Um, and it's used extensively by Native Americans. Again, uh, through the U.S. and Canada, a lot of the Native American tribes that live there use this plant for a variety of different reasons. The leaves are what are mainly used from the plant. Um, they're used in smoking mixtures. And kinnikinnic, which is kind of a generalized Native American term for the plant, it has several different names. Obviously, the different tribes called it different things, but kinnikinnic is one of the most recognized. Kinnikinnic means smoking mixture. So this plant was used either to soften the harshness of tobacco when they smoked tobacco, uh, or added to other mixtures. It generally wasn't, it could be, but generally wasn't smoked by itself. Uh, it has astringent properties, excuse the misspelling there, uh, it has astringent properties which uses to wash for sores. It could be used as a tea for cold, chest, and lung conditions. Um, and it has anti-inflammatory and antiseptic properties, which is probably the most widely known and widely used reason for the plant are these properties here. It was used to strengthen the tone of urinary passages in response to inflammations from urogenital diseases and from venereal diseases. Um, again, because it was used by such a wide range of peoples, there's tons of different uses for it. This is just a small amount, but you see you can tan with it. In Sweden and Russia, the tannins in the plant were used for tanning. Um, you've got for backache, bladder ailments, bronchitis, diabetes, diarrhea, etc. There's a lot of different uses for this plant. The chemistry of it contains a bunch of phenols, tannins, and flavonoids. The flavonoids can be used to differentiate uh, between the different taxa within the genus. Uh, obviously, through different geographical regions, uh, the plants obviously in the United States are going to be different from those found in Russia. Uh, and you can kind of um, see the differences between those and the, the flavonoids that they have. The main phenolic constituent is arbutin, which is probably the most important part of the plant. It's what a lot of studies have been done on. And it's got about a 5 to 18% content within the plant. Uh, most important flavonoid is quercetin 30 galactoside And it has anywhere between a 6 and 40% tannin content, which again is why some of the plants can be used for ta um, tanning because of the tanning properties. The leaves of the plant, I'm sorry. Uh, some of the other constituents are listed here. Um, again, this may not be an all-inclusive list. There are a lot of different things that are in there. Um, one of the... Um, one of the papers that I used for research on this had almost four pages of you know, constituents in it, including uh, um, a, lot of other, a lot of other things as well. Uh, back to arbutin for the biological activity. Again, this is probably the most important part of the plant. Um, it's got antimicrobial activity and is dependent on hydrolyzation by beta-glucosidase um, to produce hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is what gives the plant its uh, antiseptic and astringent properties. Um, and one of the studies on essential oils of the plant found that, again, all these large number of essential oils and constituents of the plant play a pretty important role in the medicinal properties of it and why it can be used for such a wide range of medicinal uses. Um, and the, some of the biological effects uh, um, of the antioxidants extracted from the plant were studied on food-related bacteria to get a general idea of um, of how strong they were and whether or not it could be used as a natural replacement for synthetic antioxidants. Um, this study here saw, what this study looked at was hydrophobicity of the, um, 
of the bacteria. So some of the properties in the plants actually reduced hydrophobicity of the uh, bacteria. And this hydrophobicity level is um, related to the pathogenicity of the bacteria. So in things like Staphylococcus aureus, they saw an actual decrease in hydrophobicity of it when, um, when introduced to some constituents from this plant. Um, they do warn that not all of bacteria within this study actually saw a decrease. Some saw a slight increase. So you have to be careful when using a plant like this for nutraceutical, in a nutraceutical aspect. Um, but again, it could be used potentially with more study as a non-medical use for the plant. Uh, some clinical studies, the, um, the best clinical study that I was able to find on the plant uh, had to do with um, women who experienced cystitis. And these were women who had at least three bouts of cystitis before the study, at least one within six months of the study, so it was a very recent thing. Um, so what they did is they treated 57 women, 27 of which on a placebo, and 30 on this UVAE. And this UVAE was a hydroalcoholic extract from the leaves of uh, bearberry, as well as something mixed in the taxicum, taraxicum officinale for, diet, for mild diuretic properties. Um, they were given three pills a day for one month, and there was actual, actually a significant effect on the recurrence between the two groups. The UVAE group saw no recurrence of the cystitis, whereas the placebo group, they did have some women who had recurring issues with the uh, with the infection. Um, and the study determined that there is a significant prophylactic effect, and, but it probably generally works with more common microorganisms. Uh, another study looked at hydroquinone, which like I said has the antiseptic properties of the plant uh, and comes from arbutin. Um, it's immunogenic and carcinogenic substance, which is created um, through interaction with uh, intestinal gut species. Um, and 65 to 75 percent of our butin is released in the urine. So this isn't really something that is a huge issue if you've got small amounts of our butin in your system, but at larger amounts, if you end up producing a lot of hydroquinone, it can be bad for you. Um, so you just have to be careful with consumption of it. Some of the contraindications of this plant, um, again, there's a wide range of tannin content in it, but if you're making a tea or a mixture that, um, from the leaves, you have to be careful not to, not to ingest too much because you can um, get stomach problems from the tannin content in the plant. Um, prolonged use can be, again, prolonged use of high amounts can be damaging to the liver because of the high tannin content and the hydroquinones. Hydroquinone itself, again, it comes down to how much you actually have in your system. But hydroquinone itself is oxytoxic and can lead to collapse, convulsion, delirium, nausea, tinnitus, and possibly death. You have to have a very high content. But, um, and then some of the antiseptic compounds uh, require your urine to be alkaline. So you, um, those who are actually using it for urogenital issues don't need to be eating any acidic fruits or foods beforehand or during the treatment with the, uh, with the plant or with the extract that you're using. Some of the current use of this plant, um, it's used in homeopathy homeopathy for uh, cystitis, dysuria, hematuria, incontinence, pyelitis, urethritis. Again, mainly urogenital diseases right now. Um, whereas it was used for many different things in the past, this is kind of what it's been funneled into is strictly urogenital issues. And there hasn't been enough research uh, on other things to really say for sure whether they can work, whether it was actually a legitimate, um, a legitimate help for other issues that it was used for by Native Americans and other people. Um, like I said, many of the, issue, many of the different um, constituents of it have not been fully explored. Arbutin is probably the main thing that comes from bearberry that's, bearberry that's been explored the most. Uh, and you can find supplements, vitamins, skincare products containing bearberry, which may or may not actually be helpful. A lot of times you just see, especially for I think some of the, um, some of the supplements, it's really not that helpful. <laughs> so you've got to do your research before you end up using any of these. Despite being used for over centuries for a wide variety of ailments, it's most commonly used now for urogenital problems again. Uh, many of the studies are focusing on the potential benefits or effects of arbutin and hydroquinone. You've got kind of a balance there where too much, uh, too much arbutin results in a high amount of hydroquinone, which can be dangerous, but arbutin itself 
uh, when hydrolyzed, again, you have those uh, antiseptic properties. Um, and it can be used for medicinal purposes, but should not be used without a well-grounded or researched knowledge base of the plant.